thank you to all the participants for joining us today. We'll just wait for a few minutes so that all the participants who have registered with us can join in. Till the time, I'll uh, raise poll for all of you. So, on behalf of Medical Learning Hub, this is Dr. Ridhima Kamal, and I would take immense opportunity and pleasure to welcome you all to the live webinar on treatment of TB, MDR TB, and case presentations New Regimens for TB and MDR TB, supported by Viatris. Now, I would like to take the opportunity to invite and welcome our esteemed speakers for the evening. So we have speakers, Dr. Rohit Sarin and Dr. Bamin Tada with us today. Thank you so much, Dr. Rohit, for joining us. Dr. Rohit Sarin, he is the principal consultant and former director, National Institute of Tuberculosis and Respiratory Diseases, New Delhi. He is a senior tuberculosis consultant with four, over four decades of experience in the specialization and having specialized training in tuberculosis, both within the country and at international level in Japan and New York. He is the former chairman of the Regional Green Light Committee MDR TV Advisory Group for Southeast Asia region and subsequently a member of the RG LCCR and Global Drug Resistance Initiative. He has also contributed to the fight against COVID-19 as a member of the National Task Force on COVID which define the treatment guidelines in this regard. Further, he is also a member of the WHO Global Guideline Development Group on Treatment of COVID and involved in global policy. Dr. Rohit Sarin has also been awarded as Carol Stiblo Public Health Prize 2017. He has been awarded as R. Krishna Memorial Prize given by TV Association of India 1995. He has been awarded with Commendation Certificate and Trophy by TV Association of India 1996. And he has been awarded by Dr. O.A. Sharma Award by Tuberculosis Association of India in 2006. We are so honored and pleased to have you with us, Dr. Sarin. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Now, now, I would like to move forward to introduce the second speaker for the event, Dr. Bamin Tada, who is the Medical Secretary of Council of Baptist Churches, Northeast India, Buhari Assam. He has also presently been serving as Governing Council Member, Northeast Christian University, Nagaland. He is, he is the Secretary of TBU Association of India for Northeast India. He is a member of Management Committee, Sri Sankara Deva Guwahati, 2022. He has also held positions Director, State TB Training and Demonstration Center, Arunachal Pradesh. He has also been the Joint Director of Health Services, TB Arunachal Pradesh. He has been the State Program Officer of Disaster Management. He has also been deputed as a Deputy Director of Health Services, TB, IDD, Nutrition, etc. Sir has been awarded with Professor S. N. Tripathi Oration Award for Longest Serving TB Programmer Officer in India, NATCON 2013. And he has also been awarded as Pravarjan Mitra Award by Environmental Medical Society of India. We are so honored to have you with us, sir. Thank you. So I would briefly introduce to you the structure of webinar. So we will be sharing a pre-event user poll, which we have already shared with all. And Dr. Rohit Sarin will be taking care of Dr. Uh, DRTB management under NTEP. And Dr. Bamin Tada would be talking about how to make a regimen for DRTB. We are so honored to have both the speakers with us today. And after the both speaking session, we'll be having a 10 minutes question and answer session for all the audience and participants with us. And then I'll be sharing a vote of thanks and I'll be sharing a post event poll for all the participants and audience who will be there with us because your feedback is extremely very valuable for all of us. So these are a few general instructions for all the participants here. All the participants will be muted during the webinar. If you have any queries, please type in question and answer se section. If you have any comments, please type in chat section. Queries and questions will be addressed at the end of the webinar by the moderator. 
This session will be recorded and shared following the meeting. Email notifications will also be sent once the recorder is available on our website. The polls has already been raised at the start, and we will also share one more poll at the end of the session for all the participants. We request all the participants to please provide us valuable feedback because we really need them for the seamless and smooth forming of the upcoming events. Now, I would please like to invite Dr. Rohit Sareen for his session. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ridhima, and uh, I would like to thank the organizers for this opportunity to talk on uh, the programmatic management of drug-resistant TB. I am sharing my slides. Please uh, let me know if these slides are visible. Uh, yes, sir. it is visible. And uh, I am doing it the full screen. So uh, the treatment of drug-resistant TB under the programmatic management of drug-resistance TB. So this is uh, basically what uh, uh, I'm going to talk on. And uh, I'm trying to see if I can move this somewhere because it should... Uh, the slides are moving. Okay, so uh, you see, the uh, when we talk of uh, the programmatic management of drug resistance TB, we have uh, uh, certain regimens which we call as the uh, the standard uh, regimens, and uh, uh, the standard regimen means that in a programmatic <laughs> setup. We are able to, uh, you see, deliver the treatment to the patients uh, by even a doctor at the PHC level who may not have had any specialized uh, training or uh, qualification in uh, uh, pulmonology or uh, uh, for, so for that matter, uh, tuberculosis. Uh, so when we are talking of uh, the standard uh, DRTB regimens, there are broadly speaking, three regimens that we talk of. One is the all oral isoniazid uh, drug resistant TB, which may be mono or poly resistance. Then there are the MDR TB and the MDR TB could be a shorter regimen or the MDR TB could be a longer regimen. But before we understand this, I think it is important to see that in which conditions we would give which particular regimen. And as you are all aware that, uh, you see, whenever any TB patient is diagnosed, and in some cases, even when a patient is suspected to have TB, we subject the sputum or any other sample to a molecular diagnostic test, which we call as the NAT test. It's available as gene expert or as true NAT test in the system. And if rifampicin resistance is detected, we have a particular algorithm. And if rifampicin resistance is not detected, then we have a separate algorithm. So first we will come to a situation where rifampicin resistance is not detected. And in that case, we will start the patient on first line treatment. And simultaneously, we will put the patient on uh, a test for first line, line probe assay. That means a uh, a diagnostic test which will tell us whether there is resistance to isoniazid or not. Here, if isoniazid resistance is not detected in that context, it will be the same first line treatment will continue with the four drugs uh, which will be given for two months and then uh, the three drugs which will be given for the remaining uh, four months. So that is the usual treatment for TB as we are all aware. If isoniazid resistance is detected, then we will start on a particular therapy and simultaneously also test for any second line drug resistance. Why second line drug resistance at this stage? Because one of the treatment options that we have for the H mono or poly drug resistance 
it contains a uh, quinolone and uh, therefore we have to test whether the patient is sensitive or resistant to the quinolone you see the earlier belief was that if there is resistance to inh the first line drugs the four drugs are so strong that uh, uh, you know the uh, remaining drugs will take care of the patients and even in the who guidelines at that point of time it was that just give r z e for a nine month period and that will be sufficient for a patient to get treated however you know evidence subsequently came that when we analyze the outcomes for these patients who were put on treatment we found that 45% of the patients failed on treatment and almost half of those who had failed on treatment they developed drug resistant tb which was even worse so therefore you see h resistant tb needed a separate regimen we could not just carry on with the regimen of rifampicin z and ethambutol uh, because uh, that would lead to a uh, much more multi drug resistant tb developing and in that particular context you see the the regimen which has been suggested uh, was you see based on certain evidences so the meta analysis of the evidences was done to see what should be the drug which should be added whether we should add a fluoroquinolone whether we should add an injection like streptomycin to this regimen and then what should be the duration because as i have said that who in its earlier guidance had stated that for such group of patients we will give just three drugs rze for a period of 9 months so here the meta analysis showed that if individuals were treated for a period of 6 months they had a higher likelihood of treatment success than if they were given for more than 6 months secondly you see in the different studies which were conducted uh, levofloxacin was used and it was observed that uh, levofloxacin the ideal uh, duration of treatment would be about 6 months so with these in mind uh, you know the the questions which were answered by this meta analysis was that if we add a fluoroquinolone then treatment success rates are much higher than if we did not add the fluoroquinolone secondly the deaths were much reduced so the outcomes in that context were very much better with a fluoroquinolone than without a fluoroquinolone and lastly you see in uh, the most important factor is that we are not augmenting drug resistance so uh, with this in mind uh, of course the obvious choice was that we will add the fluoroquinolone to our regimen r z e however the patient selection is very important and we must know that rifampicin resistance is not there because if we give this particular regimen to a patient who is also having rifampicin resistance then it will be a miserable failure and the outcomes will be very further you see we must also ensure that resistance to the quinolone is also not there because in the indian context we have found that quinolone is a class of drugs which is used very extensively as an antibiotic and the background resistance to quinolone is high and that is the reason why you know in my earlier algorithm which i had shown that uh, the second line lpa also becomes very important which will be able to detect if the quinolone uh, is resistant or sensitive in that particular patient so the regimen which is chosen is a 6 month regimen comprising uh, comprising of rzd plus levofloxacin it is not recommended to add injection streptomycin or other injectable agent because in our national drug resistance survey which was conducted just uh, a few years back it was observed that all those individuals who were isoniazid resistance uh, most of them over 80% had also streptomycin resistance so uh, you know uh, the the idea here was that okay Uh, if uh, uh, individual is h resistance we should try to avoid the injection and uh, the the other thing uh, as i have said is that uh, we put the patient on this treatment send us 
sample for you know second line lpa and culture and dst to the other drugs just to be sure that in case we need to change the regimen for any region we should have the uh, sensitivity profile of the bacteria in this patient and uh, uh, you see if the results show that there is no further resistance then we will continue the same treatment and if further resistance is documented then treatment is modified accordingly which i will come to in the subsequent slides now in what situations would a change in regimen be required you know this six month regimen of uh, rze plus levo when do you think we may require a change in this well if there is additional resistance detected through our other mechanisms other laboratories if there is intolerance to any drug an individual may develop intolerance to any of the drugs being given if there is non availability of the drug in use or if there is emergence of any exclusion criteria for giving any drug you know for for example there may be some uh, criteria the individual may have already taken the quinolone for a very long time or individual may develop hepatitis because of rifampicin and that cannot be given so we will need to really exclude that uh, particular drug or if the patient uh, has failed on the treatment that we are giving and definition of this failure is that if an individual continues to be sputum smear or culture positive uh, then we will need to change the treatment this is the pre treatment evaluation uh, well uh, only thing to be mentioned here is that we need to do a chest x ray also and we need to do a sugar testing and hiv testing that is routinely part of the program and any result of uh, the pre treatment evaluation is valid for one month so even if a, a doctor has done the you know the 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 investigations two weeks back There, there is no need to repeat the investigations. We can consider them valid for starting the treatment, and of course, uh, active drug safety monitoring systems must be in position. This treatment could be extended even beyond six months in certain situations. If the individual has extensive disease, if the individual have uncontrolled comorbidities, you see, TB and diabetes are very common. so if an individual has uncontrolled diabetes we would like to extend the treatment from 6 months to 9 months all the four drugs remember here there is no intensive phase or continuation phase it is just one phase if we give it for 6 months and may extend it for 9 months in these particular situations and if the smear at the end of fourth month or culture at the end of third month is positive this again tells us that we have to increase the duration and for extra pulmonary tb definitely treatment duration has to be increased and in certain forms of extra pulmonary tb say like cns tb and skeletal tb miliary tb this same treatment could be given even up to a year and if the person continues to be smear positive at the end of 5 months or later then uh, as per definition he is declared as treatment failure we repeat the different cultures and we will then based on our culture results take a decision what drugs to be used now if for any reason we cannot use the levofloxacin say our second line dst tells us that levofloxacin is resistant then we will either replace it with high dose moxi if the second line lpa pattern suggest that the mutation uh, is uh, 3c is absent when mutation 3 is absent then usually individual will be sensitive to high dose moxi however if high dose moxi or pyrazinamide cannot be used then we will replace uh, with linozolid so we still have a four drug regimen in which linozolid replaces the quinolone or the z depending upon the resistance and if both of them cannot be used you see there will be certain situations where Uh, you know z cannot be used because of hepatotoxicity quinolone cannot be used because of uh, resistance profile then we will add uh, two drugs from linozolid clofazamine cyclosporine preference is given to linozolid and clofazamine and of course if rifampicin resistance is detected then we will have to shift to a different regimen altogether so in the situation where we need to have a replacement 
in that situation we need to prolong the treatment from 6 months to 9 months that should be very clear so whenever we are thinking of uh, you know uh, replacing one drug with another drug we should extend the particular treatment what about pregnancy and lactation well one can give these drugs safely in in pregnancy and lactating mother of course because rifampicin is being used here so oral contraceptive uh, interaction is there so we have to be a bit cautious and other suitable contraceptive could be adopted the second now uh, question is what about now this is h mono or h poly drug resistant tb now shorter mdr tb regimen you see mdr tb we all know is resistance to both rifampicin and isoniazid and now we come to the left side of this particular algorithm and if it is rifampicin resistance is detected we will again like to do certain tests from the laboratory first line and second line line probe assay and culture and dst and then based on that we will come to the conclusion what particular regimen to give however you see because the lpa report comes early therefore an early decision can be taken and we need we need not wait for the culture and dst to start the treatment and when the culture and dst report becomes available then if required we may change the treatment or continue on with the uh, or other other treatment option which we are already giving so the shorter mdr tb uh, regimen which is of 9 to 11 months can be given only in situations where there is no resistance to fluoroquinolone or second line injectable because you see these are the drugs which are being used in this particular uh, regimen and uh, it can be used for extra pulmonary tb provided it is not the disseminated form of tb or cns tb or tb meningitis it can easily be given to children it can be given to people living with hiv but if they are having extra pulmonary tb in addition then it is contraindicated and pregnancy is an exclusion criteria because here we are using an injectable therefore it uh, is a issue whether and how to use it in uh, and what regimen to give in pregnancy but now that uh, you see and then there is another drug which we call uh, which is ethionamide and which is uh, again a terror a drug which is not safe in pregnancy and hence we will not give this particular regimen in a pregnant lady what is the regimen it's a 9 to 11 month regimen with an intensive phase of 4 months which can extend to 6 months the continuation phase always remains 5 months and it consists of a, a moxifloxacin high dose clofazamine which is a, a, a drug a newer drug repurposed drug then canamycin is an injectable ethionamide high dose h z and e and after this intensive phase of 4 months we will omit the canamycin we will omit the ethionamide and we will omit the high dose h the other four drugs will continue for a period of 6 months now currently of course the thinking is that instead of the injectable we should replace it with bedacolin and an all oral shorter mdr tb treatment has been now advocated in the country and in fact this 24th march only it was declared that this bedacolin based regimen will apply across the country and injectable will be phased out but the thing to understand is that you see it is a package of treatment and if any drug needs to be omitted or changed then of course we have to switch to the longer regimen we cannot give this particular regimen in that situation so we will do the sputum smear at the end of the intensive phase if it is negative we should continue on with the same but if it is positive we will do again further laboratory investigations if there is no additional resistance then maximum of 6 months we will give the intensive phase uh, and then shift on to the continuation phase however at 6 months also if the sputum is positive then it is declared as treatment failure and we take appropriate action 
as per the DRTB algorithm that we have. Then comes, you see, situations where we cannot give the shorter MDRTB. That is, I have already discussed the exclusion when the disease is very extensive, when we are getting, uh, uh, you see, other forms of extrapulmonary TB, uh, disseminated TB. Uh, or in all those situations, or if the fluoroquinolone resistance is detected, that is, it is pre-XDR, then we cannot give the shorter MDRTB regimen. We will have to give the longer MDR-TB regimen. And this longer MDR-TB regimen is given for pre-XDR and XDR-TB patients and for MDR or rift resistance patients who cannot be given the shorter oral bedaquiline containing regimen. This could be because of additional resistance in the shorter regimen, because of intolerance, non-availability or emergence of exclusion criteria. And which drugs now to use in the all oral longer regimen, that is an issue. And in fact, WHO, you see, reclassified the drugs, anti-TB drugs, based on efficacy and safety. Earlier, the classification was only on efficacy. But then it, safety was an issue, patient compliance was an issue, and the acceptability was an issue. And therefore, it was decided to regroup the drugs, give them those drugs which are efficacious and safe, the higher priority as compared to those who are, which are, may be efficacious, but less safe. So this grouping includes the group A, which includes the quinolones, levo and moxie. Then it includes this newer drug, betacolate, and it includes linezolate. So this is group A drugs. And the recommendation is that all three of these should be given to a patient if he's suffering from uh, XDRTB, pre-XDRTB, or MDRTB when he cannot be given the shorter regimen. Then there is group B, which again contains repurposed drugs. Now, clofazamine is added here, and cycloserine is an uh, uh, earlier used drug also, but clofazamine is one of the repurposed drugs. And then there is a group C drug. So you will understand here that earlier you see these drugs like cycloserine and it, they were relegated much lower down in the table. But here they are much higher up. You see clofazamine is now coming into group B, whereas in the earlier classification, it was much lower down um, in, in, in a group which they used to classify as with unproven efficacy and so on. But now uh, and, and in the group B, we have ethambutol and delaminate. Delaminate is again a new drug, a very good drug. Uh, uh, and it is, uh, you know, I will show you how to use this particular drug in my coming slides. Then there is pyrazinamide and then the injectables, imipenem, amikacin. So this is the WHO classification. And group C drugs here are in the decreasing order of preference. So that means... Ethambutol is the most preferred drug and PASS is the least preferred drug in the group C classification. WHO recommended that we should start with at least four drugs in all patients who are on this longer uh, regimen. And uh, that would mean all three from group A and at least one from group B. And if we cannot give this, then we can add two from group A and both the group from group B. So this is something that give four drugs in the initial phase and at least three drugs uh, in the rest of the period after the bedoculin is stopped. And if the regimen cannot be you know, composed with group A and group B drugs alone for any reason, maybe ADRs, maybe resistance, then we will have to add the drugs from group C and the order of preference was what was given in the table as shown before. However, in India, when we analyzed our field situation, then we wanted to make it simple so that you see two frequent changes in the regimen in the periphery may not be required. So we said you will start with all five drugs, three from group A and two from group B, you see, and then continue. So stop bedoculin at the end of the initial six to eight months, and then use the other four drugs. That is what was the, uh, the, the regimen which the government had 
has recommended. So this is the, the, the particular regimen which I am talking about. So the duration is 18 to 20 months. There is no separate IPPP. Bedaculine will be given only for six months and extended beyond six months as an exception. So uh, bedaculine as such will not be given for more than six months until and unless there are certain conditions and I will come to those conditions. Peridoxin is preferably given to all DRTB patients. And for pre-XDR and XDR-TB patients, the duration would be 20 months. It would not be 18 months. So this is what uh, the national program advocates. Caution when we use this, of course, when we are giving uh, certain drugs, cardiotoxicity is an issue, especially with bedaculin, levofloxacin, that's the quinolone and clofazomine. So uh, QTC is to be looked at, that is the QT, corrected the QTC interval, that has to be seen. And it should be, uh, you know, not above 500 milliseconds. And serum electrolytes must also be assessed because if the electrolytes are deranged, this can again lead to prolongation of the QTC. For linozolate, there is pancytopenia is an issue, peripheral neuritis and optic neuritis is an issue. For cycloserine, we know seizure disorders and depression. So we need to keep the neurologist and psychiatrist in the loop of treatment. And for clofazamine, it is the brownish discoloration of the skin. Extension of the treatment, you see. So after six months of treatment, we review the patient and only extend the treatment in case the sputum smear and culture are positive. And the, as I've said, the maximum duration of extension could be to eight months, you see. And if smear is positive or culture is positive, at eight months, then we declare is at a failure, reassess the patient with a new culture and DST, and then start an individualized treatment rather than a standardized treatment. Maximum duration should not be more than 20 months. And in certain specific situations, medicolin can be used beyond six months if we cannot make an effective regimen otherwise, you see. So if only two of the five drugs are available from group A and B, and adequate number of group C drugs are not available due to high background resistance, then we will add, we will extend the medicolin. So these are additional considerations for the use of the newer drugs. For medicolin, it can be given to adults and children aged five years and above. Weight should be at least 15 kg. And in children, we use it in consultation with the pediatrician. Uh, pregnancy and lactating women can be given this drug. You see, earlier when we started, uh, the, the, that was an issue. Uh, but now it is recommended it can be given. Cardiac arrhythmias, when stabilized with medication, in such patients also we can give it. However, if the arrhythmia is uncontrolled, then it cannot be given. And if persistently the QTC interval is prolonged more than 500 milliseconds, then again, it cannot be given. Even though we give these guidelines, but we say ultimate decision is by the treating physician. You see, the irrespective of what the hematological changes are there, what the ECG changes are there, we let the physician take the, uh, you see, the risk benefit analysis and take a call whether to use this drug or not, because this drug has a lot of benefits in terms of uh, early conversions and better treatment outcomes. You see, this other drug, which is a newer drug, is delaminate. It can only be considered for longer uh, MDR-TB or XDR-TB. It is not to be given for a shorter regimen and preferably given after a standard meal, you see. Uh, the advantage of delaminate is it could be given to smaller children also. I mean, even three years plus can be given this drug. And uh, uh, you see there are no drug-drug interactions between delaminate and some antiretroviral drugs. This was shown in trials. So because if a patient has HIV with MDR-TB, this could be of some relevance. Now, if some drug needs to be changed, you see, what short should be the replacement sequence? That becomes very important. You know, WHO has defined a particular replacement sequence, which I had shown you, 
that we will start with ethambutol as number one. But here, uh, uh, you see the replacement sequence in the Indian context is delaminid, amikacin, pyrazinamide, ethionamide, pass, ethambutol, and then the penums. Now, this is because uh, you see our national DRS survey has already told us that individuals who are MDR have a very high resistance to ethambutol also. So there is no point in you see using ethambutol in an MDR TB patient. Delaminate is a very good drug, so that should be given the first preference as far as uh, you see a replacement of drug is concerned. Injectable, if the patient is sensitive and can tolerate, we will like to give. Otherwise, we move on to pyrazinamide, ethionamide, and pass, provided the patient is sensitive to these particular drugs. So the replacement sequence is according to efficacy, according to resistance profile, the prior use of the drug, side effects, and the background resistance. You see, preferably we go for an all oral regimen rather than uh, uh, you see injections. And in the final 12 months, of course, we would not like to, uh, you, you see, uh, add the laminate and amicacin in a replacement. And we would like to continue with three or four drugs. Combined use of the laminate and bedacolin, well, it could be if we cannot design a treatment regimen using all five drugs from group A and B, then we can add both delaminid and bedoculin together, right? Duration is limited to six months. Uh, extension, of course, beyond six months under certain situations. The third slide on replacement sequence is discussing imipenem, but that imipenem in the Indian context, we are not using, firstly, the cost. Second is the operational issue of placing a catheter. But BPOL regimen, it can be considered as a last resort. I'll come to what is this BPOL regimen. Then, does surgery have a role in DRTB? Yes, when there is unilateral resectable disease, then surgery can be considered and should be offered to every patient. You see, provided you have an expert surgeon at hand. And in these situations, absence of clinical or bacteriological response to therapy it is of utmost importance. When there is high risk of failure or relapse, we have to consider it. If there is a morbid complication of parenchymal disease, recurrence of positive culture, things like that. You see, so that means in difficult situations, we must always consider surgery as an option. What about contacts of DRTB? I just like to touch on this, that well, uh, studies have shown that most contacts of MDR-TB who develop TB have also MDR-TB. So therefore, uh, you see, as per Indian guidelines earlier, we had said nothing to be given, just follow up the contacts of DRTB. But now you see the, the, the thinking is that yes, uh, we, could, we could give an additional uh, benefit and that is uh, levofloxacin to be given for six months if the index patient has uh, sensitive to levofloxacin. And so the point to remember here is, friends, that a longer regimen with betacolin will be used to treat patients who are not eligible for shorter regimen. So preferred option is the shorter regimen. Preferred op option is the all oral regimen. The sequence as far as replacement of drugs is concerned is delaminate has precedence over the other, other drugs. Extension of bedoculin could be done in certain situations and even combined use of bedoculin and delaminate can be considered in regimens where otherwise we do not have sufficient drugs to make up the, you see, the treatment option for this patient. A word about BPAL regimen, well, WHO recommended this under operational research conditions and not for routine programmatic use. And in fact, the evidence was that the BPAL showed overall 90% favorable outcomes. So you see, this was a study, NICS TB trial, uh, which was done in South Africa. But the issues here was peripheral neuropathy because of high dose of linezolid. Linezolid was given as 1200 milligrams once daily. BPAL is bedoculin, pretominate, and linezolid. 
Pretomonid is 200 milligrams, betacolin 400 milligrams for the first two weeks, and then 200 milligrams three times a week for 24 weeks. It is a six month regimen, and option to extend it to nine months is there if the culture is positive at the end of four months. You see, the National Technical Expert Group in India has recommended BPAL only as a last resort uh, under prevailing ethical standards. But of course, research is going on at NIRT Chennai with the, uh, the, this particular combination, uh, but with, of course, uh, uh, reducing the dose of linozolid as a reduced dose of linozolid has also been shown to be effective in the Zinex trial. Pretomonid has been approved by DCGI and uh, uh, the drug has to be made available to the NTP. That is the status. And of course, this is the point to remember that we can use, uh, you see, the BPAL regimen under certain situations. So universal DST and integrated algorithm is the diagnostic algorithm for uh, DRTB. Ensure early initiation of appropriate treatment. When I say appropriate treatment, that you should have the resistance profiles available. You should not give uh, a treatment which does not cover the, the bacterial resistance profile. Injection-free regimens are preferred and newer drugs can be given to make the all-roller regimen. Shorter regimen is the regimen for the future. But what is this shorter regimen? You see, uh, WHO recently, just this month, a few days back, came out with this rapid communication for DRTB management so that countries could use it. And they use the evidence from TB practical study by sponsored by MSF, Xenex trial by the Global TB Alliance, and the next trial, clinical trial from South Africa. And what, that, what does this, uh, you see, rapid communication say? They say that the novel six-month regimen for treating MDR-TB should be BPAL-M. It can be given to people, adults, aged 15 years and above with MDR and RRTB, but there should be no previous exposure to betacolin and protamonid and linozolid. So anyone who has previous exposure cannot be given this six-month regimen. Second, they say that if an individual is also documented resistance to fluoroquinolone, then we will give the BPAL regimen, and this BPAL regimen can be extended to nine months in case the individual is not responding. Right, so that means uh, uh, for pre-XDR in, in individuals, the BPAL regimen is to be given, whereas for just plain MDR or RIF resistance, BPAL M can be given. The nine-month regimen uh, here again, betacolin would replace injection canamycin, and levofloxacin can be given in place of moxy. The rest of the regimen remains the same. One change that they have brought about is, and this is from the next clinical trial, that two months of linozolid, linozolid 600 milligrams, two months can be used as an alternative of four months of ethionamide. You see, ethionamide sometimes is not tolerated by the patient. So they say that if you cannot use ethionamide, you can replace it with two months of linozolid. That's the only exception of the change in the drugs in this particular regimen. This is, of course, the longer regimen, and this is for those who cannot take the shorter regimen. We've also already discussed this in detail. So, friends, I would say that things are changing, and probably change is the only constant as far as MDR-TB management is concerned. Every month, we get some newer, newer guideline. Every month, we get some something. Thank you so much for your patient hearing, and I can take questions at the end. Thank you. and the encouraging session for the audience. Thank you so much for being with us today. Now, I would please like to invite Dr. Baminta for his speaking session. Over to you, sir. Is it visible to you? Uh, 
Nara? Uh, is it visible? Uh, actually, Dr. Bamin Tata, sir, audio is not connected. Dr. Bamin Tata. Hello? Sir, please rejoin. Hello? Rizma, please call Dr. Bamin Tata. Uh, so I'll just... He's your... Uh, I... Yes, he has joined, but his audio is not connected. Okay. So I'll just call him. Uh, so I'll just uh, call Dr. Bahman. I think there is some uh, connectivity oh, yes, issue I, from... Yes, there. I'm calling. Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, by the time, by the time Dr. Bame Tada is the event back, so I would now like to uh, ask a few questions. Uh, Dr. Sarin, if you would like to answer. Is uh, it's treatment of, yeah. So the question is, is treatment of pulmonary TB and intrapulmonary TB are same? Well, I think uh, my presentation clearly showed that uh, Treatment for pulmonary TB, for drug-sensitive TB is defined as six months. And even for drug-sensitive TB in extra-pulmonary TB, certain times we extend it beyond six months. And that is, say, the bone and joint TB or uh, the TB of the brain. In that context, we will extend it beyond six months and sometimes uh, even beyond one year. So. For drug-resistant TB, uh, again, I have stated that in certain situations, uh, you, the treatment uh, as such will be same, but the duration of treatment will change. The, the, the duration of treatment is uh, longer uh, in extrapulmonary TB, uh, especially uh, you see when we are talking of the shorter uh, MDR-TB regimen or when we are talking of the uh, uh, you, you see the uh, INH monopoly resistance and all that. So I have already stated that you could give treatment for nine months to one year in that situation. Right. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, so, Doctor Bhaman. Uh, Doctor So, doctor, able to hear me now? Uh, please unmute yourself. Uh, can you hear me now? Ah, yes, sir. I can clearly hear you now. Yeah. I can hear me now. Okay. Actually, uh, uh, Dr. Sari, actually, uh, you have spoken the whole dream of uh, today's uh, topic, and uh, there will be no other better person than you to give the hotel. TV treatment and MDR is working for many, many years. Uh, for me, I to say that uh, my topic seems to be quite tough because uh, to propose a new uh, treatment for MDR is quite tough. I think Sarin has already covered up. But uh, he only say that WHO has already recommended to phase out the you know, injectable injection, uh, the anti TB drugs. And uh, WHO has proposed to reduce six months duration with uh, aim to attain 90% of success rate treatment. And currently, we are holding at a 59% uh, success rate with all efforts. Uh, now, I don't want to touch upon the issues of what Dr. Sarin has said. He has covered up everything. I think all the audience will be hearing that he has crystal clear is spoken very well. The evolving and increasing for treatment of MDR-TB is a colossal task. 
we have to think other than the drugs, we have to think of many, many issues. We have to think about the cost. Cost factor is very important. Duration of the WHO is trying to reduce to six months and little above. From from uh, up to 24 year, uh, 24 months and above. So uh, the whole issue is the availability of drugs and accessibility, and is uh, one of the key issues why this uh, multi drug resistant case is causing problems. Now, we have found that uh, in India itself, uh, like uh, injectable, we have been um, rapidly using the canamycin and the capromycin, and uh, the treatment failure is also very high. Also, that uh, drug side effect is, seems to be a very, very common, which is causing a... So, uh, now, if the canamycin, I think just recently only WHO has uh, insisted government of India just to ban the all injectable. Out of uh, 48,200 MDR-TB patients, uh, 25,000 above has been put into drug resistance TB. Hello. Hello. Uh, yes. Dr. Raman. So uh, it shows that India cannot do away with the, you know, injectable for treatment of MDR TB. Uh, and uh, what I want to ask you is that oral regime, which advocated by the job has a high potential for reduction of the adverse drug reactions. But the uh, cost has to be thought twice because when we teach newer drugs, the cost factor also is quite good. So we have to. And also in Indian condition, uh, to propose for the new regimen, we have to have multicentric study and uh, which has to be validated by the international agencies like WHO. So these facilities, especially power problem area like Northeast India, where I am from, is uh, very, very difficult. And even uh, uh, many parts of the country, we have a problem. Uh, I would like to request uh, the Dima just if you can share a few slides which I focus. I don't like to uh, propose any newer drugs as uh, Dr. Karin has already covered. And for, for me, nothing to add because he has spoken very well. And he has been my, rather my mentor. And uh, so only thing I want to uh, give emphasis is we are missing the very important factors like, uh, you know, we are not able to address the issue of the nutrition of the TB patients, especially MDR TB, and also the immune enhancer, which is very, very important. And uh, because, as we know, that when people are suffering from TB, their immunity is also. And also, we see that uh, uh, we, we really need to. Uh, Concentrate on the counseling. It's a very, very important component. In we the we are concentrating only in the drugs, but we are very important component like counseling. Uh, you know, it's, uh, we have omitted, and as I said, the nutrition is a very, very important factor. And uh, these are not placed in our system and not accessible. Because I've seen that uh, in my practice, I've seen that many people, especially young people, when declared as a multi-MDR TV, they committed suicide. You know? uh, so uh, many people are just uh, you know, 
really left alone without proper counseling and the proper support system. And uh, these are the few things which really when proposing a new regimen should be included in, in the, uh, like the counseling is very, very important. I said nutrition supplement, immuno enhancers, and program has to be made at a global basis because now I still remember that, you know, uh, on the beginning of my career in the TV, program. I found that there's a drug resistance case. It is called Ladakhi strain. I think Dr. Sarin will agree with me. But this Ladakhi strain was actually originated in Beijing in China. So I think if you, we don't tackle globally, the drug resistance will persist. And uh, I think uh, the uh, almost all the drugs, I think conventional drugs we have been using second line and first line drugs has been Today, I think if multi drug resistance will be fine. So, I think it's, uh, we are losing out important drugs. And uh, this is primarily because uh, this, uh, the, we are not able to think about the availability of medicine and, uh, and accessibility, as I said. And accountability is less today. I think, you know, during the COVID pandemic. Uh, uh, see, I think drastically that uh, our case load has increased. So, if you read, uh, just, just can you can you show me the other slides? So, these are I think Dr. Sarin has already spoken. I don't want to say much and uh, avoid injectable cannabis and caffeine. So this is all we have said, and certain duration we have said. I need to supply of drugs required constant supervision and monitoring and timely lab testing is a uh, hallmark of the uh, management of MDR TV and I think it's to emphasize in the new regimen. Next slide for me. Next slide, please. Next, please. Now, uh, the elimination program. Uh, L of this month, uh, I think, as I said, there is to be a global where we work together throughout the because we may be able to control the MRTV in India, but sooner or later it's going to be imported or we will be exported. Political, strong political will, I think, uh, is dying down somewhere because TV has become less important. So we said we want to eliminate TV by 2025. I think it is uh, uh, unless the program is and uh, enforced and re reinforced, probably. I don't want to go against the country's policy, but I think elimination of people closes. Dr. Stalin will agree it will be impossible with the uphill task. So uh, these are the few things I would like to get across that. Uh, now, what the newer drugs, like we are using the clopamidine and levoflaxine and tenesolid and, and, and many other anti uh, but I think we are using today. Uh, we have to jealously guard if that not the bacteria does not develop the resistance to these drugs again. Otherwise, we will be in a helpless condition. So I think uh, also uh, I don't know that how Dr. Sarin will agree with me. I think uh, uh, we have to really think of newer uh, addition like immunotherapy and all these things. And uh, so I don't know what, how it will be working. Uh, I'm, uh, as I say that uh, I'm not very qualified to talk of proposing a new drug regimen because uh, as Dr. Sari said, that every treating physician has their own option. So I think 
it's actually uh, I don't want to propose uh, much. But the only thing I want to say that uh, we have to have a new a relook about the while we are launching the WHO recommended oral treatment that reducing the six months duration and which might be you know quite a difficult task to go. Six months duration reduction, I think, according to me. I don't have much to say because uh, uh, also I think uh, uh, in uh, condition we see that I think in yoga and exercise also some role to play because uh, most of the time that the reading exercise and is given much emphasis during my uh, pr uh, practice and a clinician I always used to uh, ask my patients to have a breathing exercise so that you can uh, see lung so a supplement like uh, you know pulmotor and many other vitamins and a mineral high dose of minerals supplement which could be very good so I think these are the few things that you have to be very very carefully thought about MDR TV actually is a, uh, a publicity in breeding device because of the uh, you know, the up swing and down swing. This is the situation that uh, TV we thought it's only 5,000 years old, but I think it's a uh, record for it. it's more than 40,000 years old. It's a TV age or a human civilization itself. So I think. Uh, to eliminate from this country on the face of this art, probably I think it's quite tough unless we started to put together the global patient and the systematically that deal with MDR TV from one country to another and one culture to another culture. Unless we take this in this patient, probably I think uh, we have to really struggle. And another thing. Uh, I also have a feeling that uh, we are uh, highly misusing the the uh, this uh, strong antibiotics. Uh, misusing of strong antibiotics is one of the very very so safe to hear. The indiscriminately using this and uh, the community developed the resistance even even much before the this TV uh, we used for the treatment of MDRT. I think also we have to really think of um, the India is actual acute shortage of Dr. Sarinu Legri. India is acute shortage of the professionals like chess physicians. I think uh, we really sad to see that uh, speciality is uh, given a very less importance. So uh, Health professional and community participation is also very, very uh, essential because community has to come forward. And uh, this uh, during the COVID time, I've seen two years of lockdown. Many of the TV patients could not even go and get the daily dose of uh, the medicine. Not to think, not to talk about the taking injection. So I think uh, it, medicines are not affordable because uh, though it's supposed to be free in the government system, RNTCP or the uh, national TV elimination program, but I think it, generally speaking, it's not available. So accountability is very poor when you look around health system. Uh, either fam neither family nor our system, the health system is able to give. Priority. These few issues, I think, uh, uh, it's uh, more of talking like, like a layman, but uh, I'm sure that I have heavily uh, depended on Dr. 
Sharin for because he spoke an excellent deliberation and uh, I learned many things from him. I'm sure that all those who are participating today will be benefited immensely from the uh, lecture and just join. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so Thank much, you. Dr. Bamin, for your kind person and being with us and today. Thank you so much for your enlightening and very encouraging session with all of us. I'm sure all the audience and participants who have been there with us would be highly motivated. So now I would like to take a few questions from the audience section. So my uh, question is, uh, can we prevent a control TB by the year 2030? Uh, Dr. Sarin, would you like to address the question? Uh, well, I think uh, 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 we are not uh, today working towards control of TB, but we are working towards the end TB strategy. So in the end TB strategy, there is something what we call as uh, sustainable development goals, wherein we compare the percentage decrease from the year 2015 till the year 2030 in cases of incidence as well as mortality due to TB. So in India, you see the we have really uh, uh, our honorable prime minister has stated and he is motivating all of us to work towards achieving the global SDG target of 2030 in the year 2025. So all of us are aggressively working towards that. And uh, uh, I want, because this is a technical thing, I will just like to say that the fact that we are thinking of ending TB, the fact that we have the priority from the highest office in the country, that itself communicates that we will be reaching the goal. Time duration, it is very difficult to say. As Dr. Tada has also indicated, uh, that it it is it's very difficult to say 2025 or 2027 or 2030 or even beyond. But yes, sooner rather than later, we will be ending TB. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for addressing the question. So my next question is fluid retaining some patients on shorter regimen, pedial edema and ascites all over normal. Please uh, give your opinion, sir. Sorry, what is what is the question? Uh, fluid retention in some patients on shorter regimen, edema and ascites, all roots are normal. Give your opinion. You see, one will have to find out what is the cause of the fluid retention. And uh, uh, it is uh, uh, sometimes you see a wrong administration of corticosteroids will also lead to fluid retention. Sometimes uh, fluid retention is because of hypoproteinemia, which may be there in a TB patient. So, uh, uh, you know, uh, linked to the cause, we will have to then see how to manage it. But uh, the, the first thing is that we will have to investigate and find why fluid retention. So we, we can't say that, okay, we will attribute it to any of the uh, usually used anti-TB drugs. That is, uh, that, is not, uh, that is not there. But yes, whenever we find a pedal edema in a case of pulmonary TB, we definitely say that this is due to hypoproteinemia. Thank you, Dr. Sadeen. Uh, Dr. Tada, there's a question. Is any printable articles or booklets are supplied to general public to create awareness to eradicate on ground level to detect new cases or lapsed cases? Uh, I think, uh, to, to be frank, I think uh, this uh, ISP uh, activities regarding tuberculosis down 
and uh, we have taken um, uh, replaced by the you know the electronic media. So uh, the printing materials has been I think that drastically cartel down, but I think uh, uh, there has been effort to uh, use the media like print material, the, uh, the you know the, the radio and uh, also like TVs and uh, all sorts of things. Electronic media I think has been replaced, so it's not readily available. But I think still we do have, but it is not uh, in the large scale where the public can access to it and uh, availability, as I said. So this. These are something has to be addressed in coming days. Yes. Thank you. Thank, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Tada. My next question is why longer duration of TB in spinal tuberculosis when bacterial load is more in pulmonary, pulmonary tuberculosis? Uh, so I will repeat my question. Why longer duration of treatment in spinal tuberculosis when bacterial load is more in pulmonary tuberculosis? So you want me to respond, Riddhima? I said you may please respond to the question. Okay. So uh, you see, whenever we are talking of extra pulmonary TB, the issue is when to stop treatment. That is what is the end point where we can say that individual is now cured. When we talk of pulmonary TB, we are very clear that we have sputum to monitor. And based on that, when we talk that individual is culture negative, we look at the relapse rates we find. So therefore, we have seen that if the relapse rates are 0 to 2 percent as they are for drug sensitive TB regimen, which we are offering, we say this is an effective regimen. But in extra pulmonary TB, the issue is that the endpoint is not known because we are not able to readily access that particular site. Secondly, in spinal TB, uh, you see the thing is that the lesion that you see, the bone change that you see, that may not reverse completely. And because it cannot reverse completely, therefore, the orthopedic surgeons they usually prefer to extend the treatment. They don't know that whether the lesion is now sterile or whether the lesion still contains bacteria. And conventionally, they have been extending the treatment to 18 months. But we in the index TB guidelines have suggested a one year based on whatever evidence that we have gathered. In some studies done in Delhi uh, by Dr. Matthews, who is an expert, but uh, you see in uh, spinal TB, he has stated that even uh, nine months of therapy is good enough. So, uh, you know, these are things which are still emerging. We don't know endpoints when to stop treatment in extra pulmonary TB and more so in bone and joint TB, right? Uh, some theories are that maybe the drugs don't reach in these areas, the blood supply is an issue. That is, again, one theory. But, uh, you know, they have not measured drug levels uh, in the bone to see whether it is reaching there or not. That is, you see, but then there are different uh, uh, theories which have been postulated why a longer treatment in extrapulmonary TB. Extrapulmonary TB definitely has lower bacterial load that we all know, and uh, that is defined, right? But... Uh, but this, but these, these things are taken into consideration. What I've just stated, and uh, the concerned speciality takes a call. It's not the pulmonologists who decide. It is the orthopedic surgeons who decide on bone TB what should be the treatment duration. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Rohit Sani. Uh, so as we are uh, running out of time now, I would like to just take one more question. So Dr. Baman, would you like to answer the question? Bidaculine is not available in private sector or with chemists. How do we design completely oral regimen? Uh, yes, as uh, I, uh, I say that this uh, cost is very high also. And... Uh, affordability uh, by the common people. Uh, I think uh, in a 
comment system also i think the supply chain sometimes you know that uh, is interrupted due to some various uh, bottlenecks to tell you frankly i think uh, uh, it is some kind of disadvantage to reach uh, you know uh, target for the mdr patient to use better window because uh, I don't know whether Dr. Sarina has faced, I used to face problem because uh, when we put in the uh, uh, MDR treatment, suddenly there's some medicines that are nowhere to be found, place like our natural produce. So even in the market, it's not available. The patient has to discontinue medicine for the months sometimes, and naturally it uh, facilitates them to look the resistance. So these are the issues, and uh, you are asking a very good question. These are the issues actually we policymakers who are involved with the corridor of policy making. We should really think of making available the system. That's why I talk about availability and accessibility because people, even if they might, there's no uh, medicines available, is not easily available in the market. That's all come on. And also, there is a Blanket ban that anti TB drugs will not be sold in the open market. So, this is a, uh, this somewhere that actually we are playing a hide and seek where our actually the uh, target group are not able to, you know, able to and get the right kind of uh, response. I don't know what Dr. Sain has to agree with me. Well, well, I think uh, you see, uh, it is right to state at this juncture that betacolin is not readily available in the private sector. And the uh, reason for that primarily is that, uh, you see, uh, we have to have some uh, protection for this drug so that uh, just as happened in the case of quinolones, wherein it was widespread, rampant use, without any justification, and that landed up in resistance to quinolones. We don't want to lose this drug, betacolin. However, the government is very well aware of the fact that the private sector patients also need this drug, and therefore they are making a mechanism wherein following the government policies, following the strict uh, monitoring uh, of the patient, the private sector would also have access to the drug. Linkages are being established through interface agencies, and uh, you know that mechanism is is developing. And soon, uh, even if the private sector is not the private practitioner, individual practitioner is not uh, in partnership with the national program as per the partnership guidelines of the government. Still, the the private practitioner could have access to betacolin through this mechanism. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Sarin. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Tarda, for throwing some light on the most uh, important topic. So now I would uh, to move forward towards the vote of thanks. Uh, Ridima, uh, there are some uh, uh, questions mm -hmm. here which uh, I felt that uh, they, they need to be addressed and uh, one of them which is a very common side effect of linozolid is peripheral neuropathy and someone has uh, asked that uh, this is Dominique Sundima Sima, uh, that she has stated that how do we take care of that well uh, peripheral neuropathy uh, uh, with linozolid is not only common it is very debilitating also and sometimes it's very severe and we may have to stop the drug in certain situations. Regarding what medication can be given, well, we are uh, you know, just prescribing gabapentin uh, as an option, as a treatment option, and maybe give it in a twice a day dose. And in addition, in some cases, we are also giving amitriptyline. So uh, these are the two uh, medications that we give. We also try to stop the dose of linozolid for some time. 
and then if we have to reintroduce because the regimen merits a reintroduction we don't have other drugs in that case we reintroduce at a very lower dose of 300 mg rather than 600 mg so that is the uh, the option that we have for for this particular side effect thank you thank you thank you so much dr sareen now i would like to extend my thankfulness and appreciation for both the speakers professor dr rohit sareen and dr bavin tada for being with us today for the webinar now i would also like to thank viatris for supporting us throughout the event i would like to thank all the participants and audience for being with us from the beginning to the end of the event making it a great success thank you to all of you and also you may be you may also subscribe to all our social media platforms and you can also be updated with the upcoming tuberculosis events that we are conducting in the upcoming months so thank you so much for to everyone for being with us today thanks a lot to both the speakers we really appreciate your kind words you really appreciate your kind presence with us thank you so much for your time also i have shared my poll question for all the participants and audience here your valuable is very your valuable feedback is very important for all of us please respond to the poll questions thank you so much thank you so much dr vaman thank you so much dr rohit uh, 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 thank sir, you we... thank you ridhima i see a large number of questions still are remaining unanswered uh, i would uh, uh, request if my email could be shared with the participants anyone who wants to uh you know raise any uh, query or get it clarified please send me a email and i will respond and clarify your doubts i find that most of the doubts are uh, genuine and uh, you see they need uh, some explanation so please do not hesitate i i see many such questions but because of paucity of time i'm not able to address uh, each one of you but i will definitely respond on the email if you send me the same question on email thank you sure sir i would just share both the email ids so nice uh, dr sarin to be with you this evening and dr dima thank you so much for the initiative okay <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Bamme. It was an absolute honor to have you with us today. Good night. Good good night, Dr. Tada. Good night. Uh, good night, Ridhima. Can we good log night, out? Sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Just can log out. I have shared the email address. Thank you. Okay. Okay.